thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the last uh, of my four lectures on uh, parabolic problems. So yesterday I told you maybe the basic idea of how to solve boundary value problems. And we had uh, what we call the solution operators, which were for boundary value problems, uh, integral operators, or in the notation of the pseudo differential calculus, singular green operators. Uh, but I want to emphasize that, of course, in this lecture, I give only the very basic ideas. Uh, so this is just, in some sense, the starting point. So if you consider uh, real applications, or if you study equations, real applications are a little bit too dangerous, maybe. If you study the equations, what uh, nowadays is done, uh, then, uh, to my experience, the, uh, the most important fields of applications of this maximal regularity approach with much more complicated solution operators are equations on fluid mechanics, so Navier-Stokes, two-phase, one-phase different uh, uh, variants, uh, free boundary value problems with surface tension, for instance, phase transitions, and uh, for instance, Stefan problems, and of course also geometric evolution equations. Huh? Geometric evolution equations is of course more classical and much more is known. Uh, so therefore, uh, most papers nowadays deal with uh, variants of, of Stefan problems or so phase transitions or one or two phase uh, fluid mechanics. Uh, however, for instance, one example of an application is also in mechanics, uh, plate equation. If you have a damped plate equation, then this, this fits, uh, depending on the damping, it fits to the setting and you can show maximal regularity in LP spaces. And uh, today I want to go back uh, a little bit to uh, uh, the first lecture where I had in the first lecture I have defined maximal regularity and I always said this is useful for nonlinear problems and now I want to come back to this point and study uh, nonlinear problems and why maximal regularity can help to solve uh, nonlinear problems. So the topic of today is uh, nonlinear, or more precisely quasi-linear uh, parabolic evolution equations. And I formulate it again in a, uh, not uh, in a specific example, but in an abstract operator theoretic setting. Uh, taking a little bit uh, the idea from the first lecture. So I fix uh, a finite time interval. I always uh, fix P between one and infinity strictly, as we know. Uh, we, uh, we do not include L1 and L infinity. And uh, Yesterday, or typically, I had an unbounded operator and I had some domain, but I fix now this domain, so I have uh, two one spaces, x1, x0, so this will be the domain of my operator, this will be the basic space, uh, one spaces, one spaces with uh, x1 dense and x0, and my time interval will be as usual, denoted by J. So what we consider is uh, a parabolic equation of the following form, BTU of T minus A, depending on U of T, U of T uh, equals zero in J, and uh, U of not, of time T equals zero, equals U not. Okay, I will say about A a little bit later. And uh, let me start with uh, spaces. So here I have not included the right-hand side. This, of course, is easily possible, but I omitted in the talk today. Uh, nevertheless, uh, so we know what would be the right-hand side space. I'm considering LP, maximal regularity. So I set the function spaces, so F as LPJ with values in my basic underlying space. So think of X not 
for instance, as LPRN, X1, WP2, the domain of the Laplacian. Okay, so the standard example here. Uh, we know our solution space E, uh, which is uh, HP1, J with values in X0, intersected with LP, J with values in X1. This was the solution space, so this will be the space for U. And then we also know what is the trace space, so what is the correct space for U0, or what is the, the state space for my evolution. Uh, so the trace space, the trace space is then, and I denoted this by a gamma t because I'm considering now this time trace, or maybe it's not a definition, but it's a result. So it's the interpolation space between x naught and x one. Real interpolation is one over one minus one over p t. It's real interpolation space. This was what I mentioned in the first lecture. And in the applications, this will be some non-integer Bezos space. Right? So in this LP theory, our, our function at some fixed point uh, runs in this, in this space. Okay, we also said, sometimes I, I'm looking for uh, initial value zero. So we said zero E is defined as all U and E where u of zero is zero. Okay, so what about this operator A? So in this abstract formulation, so I take, uh, I take some, some element of E, I take its value at time t, so I land in, uh, in this trace space, and for every value in this space, A of u of t or A, this here uh, is a linear operator from x1 to x0. So in one, we always assume throughout this talk, A, which is a map from gamma t e. So I plug in this, uh, this element at fixed time. And then I get a linear operator, which I can apply to this. So this is a map to the linear operator. And it should be uh, uh, an operator from x1 to x0. And so this is the abstract formulation here. By the way, this is not the only possible way. And uh, for instance, you could also think of uh, omitting this t here, that a is simply a map on e then you could even include uh, operators which are non-local in time. This has also been done. Maybe here I should mention that what I'm telling you here is essentially the theory of Arman and Prus. And there are several variants and several papers where this maximal regularity approach is described. But this is one possibility. Okay, and uh, I assume some smoothness here. Uh, more precisely, I assume always that this operator is a Lipschitz on bounded subset. Okay. Bounded subsets of my trace space, phase space. Okay. So this means that uh, if whenever uh, this argument uh, runs on a bounded subset, for instance, in some, on some ball with some radius, then I can find a Lipschitz constant for all functions in this ball. It's locally Lipschitz. Okay, uh, let me make a remark on this embedding. So we had, this was in the first lecture, we had that this, this is the trace space, uh, but it's a little bit more precise, uh, so uh, by interpolation theory. So this is uh, what I already said in the first lecture, but I recall it and, and write it a little bit more precisely. So interpolation theory tells us, so the theory of interpolation of Banner spaces uh, yields uh, uh, the embedding
So E, uh, so taking uh, one, the value at one time point, and any one uh, gives an element here, but it's a little bit more, so it's even continuous. We have the embedding, it's continuously embedded. It's embedded into the space of continuous functions with values in gamma t. So this is the real formulation of this uh, interpolation result. And if you know if you have a continuous function with some values in some space, you can simply take the value at every time point. So uh, this embedding means, uh, first of all, that it's, it can be seen as a continuous function with these values, but we have an estimate. So the maximum of uh, t in zero t uh, of uh, the norm of u of t in this uh, phase space is less or equal to some constant times u and e. However, and this is why I give this remark here, that this constant depends on t. And in particular, if the time interval is small, then this constant constants explode. So however, so in general, ct goes to infinity if t goes to zero. Uh, so, and I'm talking today about short time existence, therefore I have to be careful. Uh, whenever the time gets smaller and smaller, then this embedding is not uniform. But if uh, U uh, has an additional uh, property, uh, it's, uh, it's zero at T equals zero. So, but for U and E zero, so which was defined here, so the value of u at zero equals zero, uh, then uh, this constant can be chosen uh, uniformly in t. This embedding. Holds with uh, ct independent. Uh, the reason for this is very simple. We had this in several talks also by the talk of Michael. Uh, if, if u of zero is zero, I can simply extend it by zero without changing the regularity. And say, I, I, I always consider, no matter how small t is, I can always consider an interval of length one. Say. So I can also take the constant c one. Okay. So this we will need later because we, will, uh, we want to have an estimate then. Um, to understand this equation, maybe I give an example. And this example is in some sense uh, one example of a quasi-linear equation which you can give in a lecture on, on uh, maximal regularity, but it's not the main aim to deal with these examples because there are classical theories which already uh, have dealt with this, which is the graphical mean curvature flow. So MCF is mean curvature flow. Okay, so what is the mean curvature flow? Uh, so it describes the evolution of a, say, n-dimensional uh, submanifold. And uh, the evolution is given in such a way, uh, so there's such a manifold, and the normal velocity, so here you have the normal vector, and the normal velocity is, uh, in this direction, is uh, proportional to the mean curvature at this point. So the mean curvature flow describes uh, the time evolution, evolution of a, uh, of an n-dimensional uh, submanifold, say m n t embedded in R n plus one, uh, in such a way that uh, the normal velocity equals to the mean curvature at one uh, at this point.
So at some fixed point x uh, equals or is proportional equals uh, the mean curvature. And this is a prototype of a geometric evolution equation. There are many, many different variants of such equations. And uh, if this manifold is uh, globally given as the graph of a function, so if, uh, say, u is a function depending on um, time and x, a real valued function, is a function such that the graph of u evolves according to the mean curvature flow. Such that its graph uh, evolves according uh, to the mean curvature flow. And then if you write down the equation, it's very simple. You have to, uh, the mean curvature is the, say, the sum of the principal curvatures. You can compute them. You can compute the normal vector. So we get uh, the following uh, partial differential equation for u. So we get uh, dt u of t minus, and then we have uh, the Laplacian minus the sum ij from 1 to n. And here we have uh, e, e, di, partial derivative with respect to xi, u of t dj, u of t over 1 plus gradient u uh, of t squared, uh, di dj. All this applies to u of t equals 0. And uh, of and you can see here, uh, this is a prototype, uh, this is an example of a quaternion equation. A quaternion because it's linear in the highest derivative, which are second order here, uh, but the coefficients of the highest derivatives uh, are nonlinear functions of are functions of the solution itself uh, and derivative of the solution. So this fits into the setting. So first of all, uh, what are the spaces here? So here I consider this uh, in LPRN. Uh, then X1 would be WP2RN. Uh, of course, then we already know the, the, the phase space, so the time trace the space for u not. Uh, this is uh, the base of space, gp2 minus 2 over p rn. And uh, of course, this is uh, this is a a at one point u of t. This, of course, this operator here minus. Uh, DIU of T, DJ minus T. DI, DJ. So this is a second order. So please note that for every fixed U of T, there's a linear second order partial differential operator. And this is exactly the situation we have in quarter linear equations. Uh, one has to be a little bit careful that this operator is, uh, this should be for every fixed u of t, but this should be a map from x1 to x0. Uh, it should be, it's a differential operator of order 2, so it should be well defined as an operator from x1 to x0, so from wp2 to lp, of course, this is second order, this is, of course, a well defined operator, uh, and this is second order, but uh, concerning the coefficients, at least it's well defined if the coefficients are, let's say, continuous and bounded. And uh, this does not hold uh, for any, any value of p, but uh, by simple embedding, if p is large enough, uh, so more precisely, if uh, p is larger than n plus 2, 
uh, we get by Sobolev embedding. Embedding uh, that uh, essentially we have here the gradient of u of t for fixed time t, and this for every t, uh, this is then an element of the continuous bounded functions on our n uh, for all uh, for fixed t for every t and every u and e. Well, this is double embedding. Uh, and this, the, so then this is a continuous coefficient and this is a multiplier in the Sobolev space and all is okay. And then therefore this is defined as a map. Uh, so therefore we get uh, that A of U of T is a, as a linear operator from, uh, linear bounded operator from WPRN to LPRN for fixed T as well. And moreover, we can also see, so for fixed t, and this is exactly the situation uh, I had before. And moreover, we can see a little bit more uh, the map uh, A as a map from the trace space uh, to uh, the set of uh, linear operators from x1 to x0. Uh, this is even uh, smooth, uh, t infinity, as a map on the on u, it's c infinity. Yeah? It's uh, essentially this is a polynomial here, yeah. And uh, so taking the uh, so here you have uh, of obviously, uh, in fact, it's real analytic. Yeah? It's c infinity. So this is a smooth map, and even uh, c omega, which means uh, real analytic. And this is also uh, typical in some sense, in particular in the geometric evolution equations. Uh, these maps, uh, which, which uh, map in some sense uh, our function u to the coefficient of this operator, uh, is a smooth function. Okay, so this is an example to understand this uh, notation and this uh, assumption. Yeah? So it's real analytic and uh, it's, it's Lipschitz unbounded structure. Yeah? Okay, and uh, now go back to this uh, equation one, and uh, we want to have uh, well postedness of this problem, and essentially in this whole approach, there are always two types of results: either you have small data and uh, large time existence, or vice versa. You have uh, large data, arbitrary data, and then a small time interval. And I decided to present both variants in order that you can see how this fits together with maximal regularity. So the first result I want to present here is existence for a large time, large time, small data. Okay, so large time here does not mean uh, the interval from zero to infinity. I fix the time, it's arbitrary but fixed. Uh, the question if a solution exists for all times is a question of asymptotics. In most examples this is also true, but then you need some, uh, some, some uh, properties of the, uh, of the uh, solution of the stationary equation, uh, of the fixed one. Uh, but so T is uh, finite but arbitrary. And uh, I need some assumption and assume, so my operator I will consider is A of zero. So I plug in here in this operator A instead of U of T simply zero. The element zero in this uh, trace space. Yeah? And I assume that this operator has maximal regularity. So it has maximal regularity in this time interval. By the way, coming back to the mean curvature flow, if I take A of zero, then I have here the zero, then A of zero is simply the Laplacian. So this we already know. Huh? So for the mean curvature flow, this is satisfied. 
And the statement is uh, then there exists then there exists an epsilon such that uh, for all initial values the small norm This equation has a unique, unique solution. U e. Yeah. So for small data, I have a unique solution. Okay. So in the proof, so all all proofs uh, in connection with maximal regularity are based on a very simple and the most simple fixed point argument, which is uh, Banach's fixed point theorem or contraction mapping principle. So I want to apply this. But first of all, I uh, use the fact that this has maximal regularity. And the definition of maximal regularity was that the, uh, the Cauchy problem to this operator is an isomorphism. Huh? So I write it in this form. So I define an operator L, which is applied to the right hand side. And uh, so this is the solution operator. So this is if and only if uh, I solve this problem with respect to this linear operator A0. Yeah. So in this sense, L is the inverse operator to this uh, Cauchy problem. Yeah. L is dt minus A0 gamma t inverse. And this is exactly maximal regularity that this operator exists and is bounded. Yeah. So it's an isomorphism of these spaces. Yeah. So by maximal regularity, maximal LP regularity, which we assume here. So L is a bounded operator from uh, the corresponding spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I want to solve uh, not this equation, but I want to solve this equation where here we have the nonlinear part. Yeah. Uh, so I set, first of all, I define in some sense the, the remainder. So set, uh, so let's say G of U at one point T defined as, so here I originally had A of U of T. So I subtract this, so this is A of U of T uh, minus a not applied to u of t. So if f equals this, then this a not u cancels and u is a solution. So uh, I want to solve exactly this equation, but not with f, but with this. And uh, so I can define the following. Let's say phi, capital phi of u defined. I take the solution operator, but instead of f, I have this uh, g of u and u naught. And then by construction, uh, u is a solution if and only if it's a fixed point of phi. So then U solves one if and only if phi of U is equal U. Okay. And of course, I already wrote it down this way, so we're looking for a fixed point and we want to apply the contraction mapping principle. And so contraction mapping. So we want to show that this is a contraction in some uh, small uh, ball. So phi is a map from 
E to E, uh, from my solution space E to itself, and I want to consider this in some closed ball. So let uh, VR be defined as uh, all functions in my space with norm less or equal than R. So R is small and will be determined later. And I want to show that this is a contraction. So first of all, we have to check that phi of VR is contained in VR, or small r. Okay, so let uh, I fix some function in this with small norm. And uh, I have here in this definition, I have to consider g of of V, yeah? so I have to consider this operator. So, and for this I note that, okay, let me estimate. Uh, so I take uh, this operator which appears in the definition of G. Uh, so I have A V of T minus A naught. Uh, for every t, so this is an operator, and I consider its norm as an operator fell from x1 to x0. Uh, but uh, this operator is locally Lipschitz. Uh, A is locally Lipschitz, and we are here in some fixed ball, so I have a Lipschitz constant. Uh, so this is less or equal than uh, some Lipschitz constant of A, which holds in VR, or let's say in V1. Uh, so I fix uh, V1 and then I have this Lipschitz constant uh, times, uh, so T is fixed here, uh, times uh, the norm of uh, V of T. Uh, A naught was A of zero. Yeah? So I have here minus zero. In, uh, of course, in the trace space here. Yeah? So this is a map from the trace space to this space. So this is, local Lipschitz. Okay, uh, but now I have this embedding. Yeah? So I know, so uh, I have to estimate this norm in this space, but uh, this, uh, I have the embedding, V is in E and I have this remark. So this is in L infinity, so for every T I can estimate this by a constant times the norm in E. So this is less or equal to uh, this Lipschitz constant. And let's say I have this as constant here. Um, let's say it's E T uh, times the norm of V in E. Uh, and this is a uh, remark for one. And capital T is fixed. So I don't care about the behavior with respect to T. Okay, and, but of course this is uh, less or equal than R. Uh, so this is less or equal than L A uh, C T R. And uh, R is arbitrary, so I can choose it small enough. And by, for some reason you will e immediately see, I say this is less or equal than uh, not one half, but one over the norm of L, this operator L. This is this operator with finite norm. Uh, for small r. Huh? So you can think of this being the definition of r. Okay. Uh, so this will be used in the estimate of this g. Yeah. And uh, I want to prove this, so I have to check what is the norm of phi of v and E. So we is still in this uh, VR. Yeah. Okay, so uh, phi is uh, defined here. So I estimate the norm here. So I can estimate it by the norm of L times the norm of this yeah, in the appropriate spaces. Uh, so this can be estimated uh, by uh, the norm of L times, and then I have uh, G of V. And E plus uh, the second component 
this uh, u naught. Oh, this is an F. G maps, uh, G maps from E to F. Okay, so F was, uh, to remember, F was uh, not any space, but it was LP, uh, zero T, which will leave me X naught. And uh, here we have the definition of T. Yeah. So we want to estimate the LP norm of this. And how can I estimate this? I take the L infinity norm of this and the LP norm of this. So I can estimate it by the L infinity norm of this, an operator norm. So this is, can be estimated uh, by just this L. Then here I have the L infinity norm, or more precisely, I have the maximum of T and zero T of the operator norm of this operator appearing here. This is A V of T minus A naught. Uh, uh, in Lx1, x naught times the LP norm of, of uh, V in x1, and this can be estimated by the norm of V in E. And this remains. Okay, but uh, this is exactly what we have estimated here. So this is uh, less or equal than one over two norm of L. Uh, so this is less or equal than L times uh, one over two twice the norm of L. And here you see why I had this norm of L in the denominator here. And then this is of course less or equal than R. Okay. Uh, so R is already fixed now. This was the definition of R. And now given R, I can now assume, and this is now my condition, that this is again small. No? So I, it should be in the same size. So plus uh, one over uh, two L R, uh, which is of course now uh, R, and which is what I wanted to have. If, if uh, the initial data as less uh, or equal than epsilon, which is exactly this one. Okay, and this is the condition for small data. And uh, by this condition now I have this, uh, uh, it's uh, mapping from BR to BR. Okay, this was the first step in this, for this uh, contraction mapping principle. And the second step is, of course, to show that it's a con uh, contraction. Okay, so I take uh, V1, V2 in, in BR. And I estimate uh, in a very similar way as before. I estimate uh, phi of V1 minus phi V2 uh, in E. Of course, I take uh, again uh, here we have uh, the phi, so we again take the norm of L. And uh, note that L is linear. L is linear. Uh, so I have uh, here L of uh, GV1 U0 minus uh, GV2 U0. You see uh, the U0 cancel. Yeah. So I can estimate it by the norm of uh, G of uh, V1 minus G of V2. Uh, this is the norm F. Yeah? Because U0 cancels away, it uh, takes a difference. Okay, and, and now I can, of course, make more or less the same thing as before. So this L is as it was. And 
this G is, uh, in some sense, uh, it depends on, on A U of T and again U of T. So I, it's a little bit better to put some terms inside. Uh, so I compare uh, A V1 times V1 uh, with uh, uh, A V1 times V2. Uh, you will see this. So it's, uh, I take again the maximum. Again, the idea is this is an LP space and to compute the LP norm, I take out the supremo norm of this operator and take the LP norm of the arguments. So I have again this maximum of supremo over T not zero. Ah, I didn't assume it's continuous. Maybe supremo is better than maximum. No, it's Lipschitz. Sorry, maximum is okay. Okay, so I have A of V1 of T minus A naught. This was this operator norm, again, in this, this year. So I have this maximum. And I, in principle, I have here V1, but I add an additional V2. So I have a V1 minus V2 in E. Of course, this was, uh, uh, this has to be canceled again. So now I have uh, the maximum over all uh, T and zero T. And now I have the differences of the of these A's. Uh, so I have A V1 of T minus A V2 of T. And now here the A naught cancels out in L X1 X naught times uh, V2 in E. Yeah, you'll see that this term a v1 v2 cancels out here. Okay, and now we are uh, in the same situation as before. So this has been estimated already. Uh, this was uh, less or equal than I had here one over two l for this. Uh, one over. Uh, Ah, R over 2L. Do we have an R here? This R comes from this here. And I have here 1 over 2L. May maybe I have to improve this a little bit. Or if I have it here, then it's uh, uh, 1 over 2L. Okay, and uh, times this. And e. Okay, this is this expression. And here again we have uh, the Lipschitz constant. So this is Lipschitz. Uh, so can I can estimate it by the Lipschitz constant. Plus, uh, uh, this was this local Lipschitz constant, LA, times uh, the difference of the arguments for fixed point T, so the maximum of all T, but then I have there again this embedding as before, this was this embedding CT. And then I have here the difference of the arguments in E. So this is the local Lipschitz property. This is this embedding by remark for one. Uh, and then I have here this uh, R. Okay, and then uh, uh, this uh, is again less or equal than one over two L. So this is uh, less or equal. And now I, I guess I should spend a little bit more uh, because if I define it in this way, I have one over two L, one over two L, uh, then it's uh, exactly one. This is not so good for contraction. So uh, let's let's uh, take care of four instead of two. Uh, uh. Okay, so uh, I, I write it first down as it was, so this is uh, less or equal than one uh, V1 minus V2 in E. Uh, this is almost a contraction. <laughs> okay, so let's make here a four. And then I have here, of course, uh, four, four, R over two. This, this doesn't matter here. Huh? And here I have four. 
And now I can, I'm uh, on the stage now, I'm not here before. I'm here for, again, for Arthur. Okay. So therefore it's a contraction. Yeah? Okay, so we have seen uh, that um, uh, Phi is a contraction in BR, and of course by Banach Dijkstra theory. Fixed point theorem, which is also known as contraction mapping principle. Uh, there exists a unique fixed point. And fixed point uh, of phi are solutions of non-equations. Okay, so this was small data. The only, I had one, one uh, condition, this was A of zero has maximal regularity. In the mean curvature flow, we have this. Because A of zero in the mean curvature flow was the Laplacian in Rn, which was a very simple example of having maximal regularity. And the other variant always is uh, arbitrary data, small time. So uh, large data, large data, small time. Okay, I have the same situation as always. So this equation one. So now I fix an arbitrary initial value. And uh, again, I need, for this result, I need uh, maximum regularity for one operator, but now this is not uh, operator at zero because zero does not play any more role here. Uh, so I d consider now the operator A naught is A of U naught. Yeah, so I plug in the initial data in my operator. And if this operator has maximum regularity, If A0 has uh, maximal regularity, uh, say in some time interval, 0, 10, T0, in X0, of course, uh, for some positive T0, uh, then uh, this solution has a, uh, this equation has a unique solution for small time. So then there exists. This uh, p greater than zero, such that one has a unique solution up to time t. and the time interval from zero to t. Okay, of course the principal idea is uh, very similar as before. So, and I make this a little bit shorter, just point out what is the difference now. Uh, so, now we set Uh, L is uh, again uh, the inverse of dt minus a naught and gamma t inverse, but of course uh, this operator is another one. Yeah? And uh, in some sense, in the proof before, my reference solution was zero, yeah? and I consider the ball around zero. This was the map, the region where we had this fixed point mapping, and now we have another reference solution. So u star. As I don't have small data, I take the solution operator to the right-hand side zero and to the initial value u naught. 
And this will be the reference solution. It starts at u naught, which is large, so it's far away from zero, but then I, cons I will consider a ball around this solution. Of course, g uh, of u of t is defined in the same way as before. It's uh, the nonlinearity in some sense. So I linearized in some sense this by a naught by g of t as before. And of course, this equation, so this fixed point mapping is again the same. So far as u l g of u of u naught. But of course, this L is different, and therefore this G, uh, A naught is different. So it's literally the same, but there are other operators here. And now I consider uh, uh, the region. We consider, and so let's call this B R prime. So I take now all uh, V and E. Uh, and I already assume that they have the correct initial value. So at time t equals zero, it's the, the correct initial value and they are close to this reference solution. So the norm of V minus U star in E is less than or equal than R to R. Of course, again, R small and later to be determined. Yeah? And uh, we want to show that this is again a, a, a contraction and uh, so it's a, a mapping from BR prime to BR prime and it's a contraction. So let me start with uh, showing that uh, phi of BR prime is a subset of BR prime. Okay, so I have to check uh, that, ah, first of all, uh, Phi of uh, phi is defined here, so phi of any v in b r prime. So let v in b r prime. So for any v in b r prime, this is the solution operator to this initial value problem. At in particular, at t equals zero, it's u naught. So this condition is satisfied by definition. So we have to check this. So we have to estimate. Uh, phi of v minus uh, u star in E. Okay, and as before, and this is Maxwell regularity, I have this estimate for the norm, this uh, operator norm. So I can estimate this by the operator norm of L. This is maximal regularity. And then it's applied to uh, g of u, u, u naught, g of v, u naught, and u star was zero u naught. So again, here the u naught cancels, and you see it doesn't matter, it's large, it cancels here. And uh, the only remaining term is here uh, g of v. And f, yeah? Because here we have the zero. And uh, okay, so now again, this is as before, so I can estimate this. So uh, again, I can estimate this by the uh, L infinity norm. of uh, the operators of A V of T minus, but now A naught was A of uh, U naught, A, uh, A of U naught, yeah. A of U naught uh, in uh, pointwise in L X one X zero. And then uh, times the norm of V in E. Okay, and then I can estimate this uh, again. L. Uh, then I have, now this is Lipschitz again, so I have this Lipschitz constant of A. Of course, now it's a larger set where I consider this, and I say, say 
uh, with norm uh, u naught, doesn't matter. Uh, so it's a large ball, but I have a different Lipschitz constant. Then I have here uh, the norm, I have here the embedding, CT, and then uh, I have here the norm of, uh, of V minus U naught in E. So here this U naught is, uh, has to be seen as a constant function U naught. So U naught is defined for one fixed T, but I, it's a constant here for every T. Uh, and then I have here, uh, so this was this here, and then I have this here. Okay, but now you have to be very careful in this, because I want to make t small. And the question is, is what about this constant here? Uh, but, uh, so this here is in fact independent of t. because uh, we minus u naught belongs to zero e yeah, because it has at, at time t equal to zero it has the value zero so this is okay with some constant which in fact does not depend on t yeah, I could write c1 or something like this okay now we have to, to understand this yeah? now we have to understand this uh, so we use, uh, let's start with this one. Yeah? So V minus U naught in E is less or equal than V minus U star in E plus uh, U star minus U naught in E. And this is, uh, by definition of my ball, less or equal than R. And now comes the point. Now the second one, u star and u naught are given functions, uh, fixed functions. Yeah? They belong to the space E. And uh, I want to make this small. Uh, and now comes the point uh, that uh, this is also less than R if T is small. If T is small. Yeah, so because uh, these functions be belong to, to E, say, T naught, some fixed capital T, and then I take the range of integration smaller and smaller, and then this integral converges to zero, of course. So for, for sufficiently small time, this integral is small. And this is exactly why I need small time. <coughs> so as... Uh, so the argument is simply uh, from integration theory. So this uh, is in E, say, T, uh, T1 for fixed T1. So the norm in, uh, in the, of the integral from 0 to T1 is finite. And then I go, uh, take the, the range of integration smaller and smaller, and then it tends to 0. And in the same way, OK, this was, uh, I will need this for this, and in the same way, uh, this one, V in E, is uh, again it's uh, less or equal than uh, V minus uh, U star, E plus uh, U star in E. So this is uh, less or equal than R by definition. And this is less or equal than R, so we have here 2R. And this is less or equal to R if it's small, so if T is small. So note that the, the range of T I define does not depend on V. This would be uh, not possible, or I don't know, but it simply de depends on the norm of these two functions. Uh, so U naught as a constant function in time, and uh, U star. These are fixed functions. So the choice of the time interval is independent of V. Okay, so what do we have here all together? Uh, if we plug this in, uh, then we get, uh, this was the starting point. 
So let's say for uh, now I choose R in an appropriate way, which was one over four times minus L L A C. And this is the first I choose. And then with respect to this R, I choose the T such that this two inequalities, these two inequalities hold. Yeah? And uh, sufficiently small, small t, we get, uh, so this was, uh, the starting point was this one, p of v minus uh, u star e, e, less than equal, okay, let's go here. I have all these constants. I have the norm of L, I have La, CT, and then I have here uh, 2R, 2R, so I have 4R squared. And if R is, uh, is this, uh, then I can take 1R to cancel all these constants here, so this is uh, equal to R. Okay, this means it's a, it's a, it maps dr prime to dr prime. And now I will skip this in exactly the same way you can show that it's a contraction. Uh, in the same way. One show. This part is a contraction. Yeah, you could do this by yourself. Uh, what, what's the difference here? Uh, so I have, uh, so essentially the point was I had here uh, A of V of T minus A of U naught, and now I have A of V1 minus A of V2, and it's the same as before. And I would guess that again the constant is not correct, so I would guess it's in the same way as before, so maybe for self uh, mapping it's okay, but probably I have a, to take an eight uh, for contraction, no, doesn't matter. Okay, so this uh, shows that we have, uh, again, by Banner's fixed point theorem, we have a unique fixed point, which means a unique solution for our equation for small time. So you could see how uh, the small time uh, was used here in the proof yeah, for the contraction. Okay, so we know that uh, our equation has uh, a small time solution. And now, of course, the whole machinery of dynamical system uh, starts. Yeah? If we have a, a local time, a locally in time, a solution, we have a solution on a maximal ex existence interval. You can also show that at the end of the existence interval, either it's infinite or if it's finite, you have a blow up of some norm. This can be made more precise. Yeah? But I don't want to uh, go into this. Except I w uh, instead I want to tell you something about uh, kind of improved smoothness. Yeah? So here I simply had a solution uh, which was uh, in, with respect to time, uh, which was just in WP1, which is maybe, it's continuous, but it's not very good. Yeah? Uh, but however, automatically if you, uh, if you know that your equation is smooth, like in the mean curvature flow, you get immediate uh, smoothness for your solution again. Yeah. So, uh, let's say a theorem. So, assume additionally Uh, that A is not only Lipschitz on bounded subsets, but it's also smooth to some uh, degree. So A is uh, CK as a mapping from the phase space uh, to L X uh, one X naught or some K in L or K equal infinity or K equal omega. So this is again real analytics.
And uh, assume that I have already given the solution. We know that the solution exists, at least for small times or for, depending on the data, for large times. So I assume that uh, uh, U and E be a solution, solution of one in some fixed time interval zero T. And now I have an additional assumption uh, satisfying satisfying uh, that A plugs in U of T, this operator has maximal regularity for all T. And then uh, the statement is then the solution is smooth again. So U is in CK zero T uh, with value from X naught. Okay, so some remark here concerning this condition. I should, I could have given this remark already in the, in the last period. Uh, here, uh, in the first statement today, in the first theorem today, I simply said A of zero has maximum regularity. In the applications, this is in any application I know, it's very easy to check because A of zero is all in all applications I know is very simple. But already here, I don't have, for large data, I don't have A of zero. I have A of U naught, and U naught is some given function. And this is, of course, much more complicated to check because now I plug in, in my nonlinearity some function. And therefore, and this is the reason, in some sense, one of the reasons of the lecture yesterday. So yesterday, I, I, you, can, you can treat a Laplace equation in Rn, say, very easily, directly, you see, nothing else. But now you plug in some function yeah, for fixed t yeah, here, also here. t is fixed, there's no problem. It's, it's still an operator just in x. But it has x-dependent coefficients. And therefore, it's, it's reasonable and necessary for applications here in this, for instance, in the Stokes business, it's necessary to, to understand that uh, parabolic operators with variable coefficients have maximal regularity. So in fact, uh, the result, uh, if, you, if you apply this, these uh, for, for concrete given equations, you don't simply check one fixed operator has maximal regularity, but you consider a class of operators so you take essentially, you remember yesterday, uh, I had the essential definition of parabolicity was that the, that the symbol did not vanish. Yeah? But now you don't take one particular symbol, you take a class of symbols. And essentially the condition is that for all U of T, if you think of yesterday, for all uh, possible values here, it's still parabolic. Because parabolicity was the essential point for maximum regularity. So you consider a class of operators with variable coefficients and show all this class, every operator in this class has maximal regularity because you don't know u of t, of course. Yeah? You cannot plug in some u of t. But you know any, any, any u of t you plug in, you're still in this parabolic class and it's still all less has maximal regularity and that's it. Yeah? And this was the reason why yesterday we re really have to deal with x-dependent coefficients. Okay, so this was in these two results. Okay, so... Now uh, this has improved smoothness. Yeah? For instance, it's analytic in time. Yeah? This is formulated in an abstract way uh, because I don't know about x naught. But if it's a differential operator, say, and if you if you if you know that x naught is is, is uh, L P R N, you can make the same proof also with respect to x. So it's the same trick, the same proof, and you can show in applications. For instance, for the mean curvature flow. It's not only, we know in the mean curvature flow it was, this was uh, analytic. So we know it's analytic in, uh, real analytic in time. But in fact, for the mean curvature flow, it's also real analytic in space with the same proof. But I cannot write it down here because x naught is an arbitrary sum of squares. Uh, so it has no x value. Okay, uh, the proof is uh, very funny here. Yeah? For me. Um, So 
So we will see that this proof essentially again depends on the idea of maximal regularity. And this has uh, become kind of famous. So the proof uses the so-called parameter trick. And I, let's say this is the idea of proof, but I want to present the essential step here. So I introduce an, arti an artificial parameter. So for a real parameter, let's say mu close to one. So run in an open interval uh, round one. Uh, we define we define uh, u mu of t as uh, u of mu t. Okay, and then we check the equation uh, for u. Then this uh, mu function u mu satisfies. dt u mu uh, minus uh, mu a of u mu u mu to zero So dt uh, u mu is simply, of course, uh, mu times uh, mu times uh, u mu, and uh, and this is the original equation multiplied by mu. So it's just simple. Okay, and uh, and of course uh, the initial value doesn't change. Okay, and now I define I consider this as a map. Yeah, define the map. The map, say capital H, which runs in some interval with respect to mu. So let's say one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon. And uh, so I ha it has two arguments. The one is the parameter, the other is the function uh, times e to the right hand side of this equation. So f uh, times gamma t e by. So I have uh, the parameter and I have my function in E and I define it as the right hand side in some sense. Huh? So, so on, on this I have uh, the function in T. So uh, dt, let's say here W, dt W at time T minus A, uh, minus uh, mu a is w t w of t yeah. it's the left hand side of this equation here yeah. and uh, the right hand side is uh, w of zero minus mu yeah. okay so now we get, uh, we have the assumptions that A is smooth to some de degree, yeah? and therefore this H is smooth of the same degree. So then H is of class uh, TK as a map in these variables here. And we also know uh, what is H at if I take mu equal one, and w equal u, u is my solution. For mu equal one, this is the original equation and u is the solution and this is also zero, then this is zero. This is zero. So for the given solution, this is zero for if the parameter is one. Okay, and now we know 
that uh, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and uh, the trick is now we want to uh, apply the implicit function theorem. Uh, so we have here one particular point where it's zero, and to apply the implicit function theorem, we need a condition on the Fréchet derivative of h. And uh, but the Fréchet derivative of h is uh, simply the linearization, and which means it's simply uh, the operator a at uh, at u, uh, the linearization of a at u, the Fréchet derivative, so the linearized operator here, a applied u, and I have this condition here, so I know that this operator has maximal regularity, and uh, so maximal regularity tells us exactly that the Fréchet derivative is an isomorphism. So by the maximal regularity condition, condition. So the Fréchet derivative. No, this not the Fréchet derivative. So D W of H. Uh, with respect, so derivative with respect to W at the point uh, one U is an isomorphism. So W H at one U is an um, isomorphism of uh, the appropriate classes here, D, F, plus one, D, F. This is the definition of maximum regularity. Okay, but this is exactly the condition of the implicit, implicit function theorem. Huh? So by the implicit function theorem, and uh, if, if you make the implicit function theorem in your uh, say analysis lecture or maybe functional analysis lecture depending on the variant of your lectures. Uh, the important message is uh, not only that you have uh, you have given you, you you can define a function which solves the equation uh, the equation you want to solve but the point is that the smoothness of this function is as good as the smoothness of this H. So uh, I don't care about uh, that it solves any equation, which, which is of course true, but uh, I just want to have the smoothness. Huh? Uh, so uh, u mu mu is of class uh, CK with respect to mu. Okay, but now we just have to remember what was the definition of u mu. Yeah. So, uh, so now we fix. Now we fix uh, uh, T naught, say, yeah. and then uh, as uh, so u mu of uh, T naught is simply u of mu T naught, and mu was uh, around one. So this is an argument around T naught, and this is CK with respect to mu, so therefore U is CK with respect to T naught. So this is, uh, of course, this is an element in the trace space. Now we, uh, this was uh, in E, but now we fix this. So this is, of course, in gamma TE. Yeah. Uh, and this is smooth with respect to mu, therefore this is respect to T. Yeah. We see that we get that u as a function is in CK 
um, on the interval with respect to gamma T. And this is in fact the real statement, yeah, but I know uh, many people don't like uh, trace spaces and therefore this uh, simply, I say this a little bit, simply by embedding, this is uh, embedded in X naught because we have an interpolation going from T. So T goes into X naught by embedding. Okay, some remark here. Uh, so this is this is a very famous proof, huh? because it, uh, to my opinion, it's very clever. You see exactly why uh, maximal regularity helps in this proof, huh? Huh? and you have nothing to do. You get a smooth function in, in many many applications. Uh, in geometrical in geometrical situation, or everything is smooth. Huh? So a remark, what I already said before. Um, um, uh, if, if you have a function in, in time and space, yeah, for instance, for the mean curvature flow, uh, so if, uh, if uh, the equation uh, lives in, in T uh, in uh, zero infinity and X in Rn or a subset of Rn, you can make the same trick with respect to t uh, to x also. Yeah. You can make exactly the same, uh, the same idea, the same trick with respect to x to x uh, uh, yields uh, smooth dependence on x. For instance, for the mean curvature flow, you can do it. Yeah? For instance, the mean curvature flow is immediately C infinity for positive times. Yeah? And in fact, for the smooth, uh, for the mean curvature flow, all these results can be applied. Yeah? So for the all the above. Uh, results can be applied. And we get, uh, and the solution in particular is smooth, huh? and uh, the solution of the mean curvature flow is C infinity or even real analytic uh, with respect to uh, T and X for positive time. And this is, of course, um, uh, one of the features of parabolic equation is smoothness. Huh? Okay. Um, the same holds, uh, the same result here holds, for instance, for the Stefan problem. Uh, the Stefan problem, which appears in, uh, in, uh, crystallization or if you have phase transitions, uh, then you also get a real analytic solution for positive times immediately. Yeah. And, and there are many, many other examples uh, where, where uh, these three theorems, uh, small data solution, uh, small time solution, improved smoothness can be applied. Yeah. So, so there are many, many applications uh, uh, really many applications. Yeah. In particular, as I said, in, in uh, phase transitions, uh, fluid dynamics, or geometric equations. Uh, and you can see uh, many applications. Uh, uh, the book by, a recent book by Pilsen and Simonet, uh, 2016. This is one, I, I, in, the, in the abstract I gave three references, this is one of these references. Uh, I have no time to explain uh, real uh, Navier-Stokes application, but all this is included, of course, technically much more involved. 
And uh, as a final remark, I would like to say that uh, this theorem I had here uh, is for these real applications in stoves is not sufficient. Huh? So there are also a final remark here. Remark. So for applications in applications, for instance, in fluid dynamics, fluid dynamics, one needs a more general version. General version. The above theorems. And as an example of, of uh, so, so we consider, consider, so dt u of t minus, and now this is one thing I wanted to say. Uh, the operator may depend on T also. It's not only possible for autonomous problems. It's also non-autonomous. So you have T, U of T, U of T. Of course, you can also include a right-hand side. And we have uh, U of not is U not. So we have uh, non-autonomous problems and we have a right-hand side. And uh, under some technical assumptions, uh, the same results hold. And I would like to uh, write down uh, assumptions just that you get a flavor of uh, what equations are in the, in the scope of this theory. Yeah. Uh, and assume. Of course, this is now a little bit technically. So first of all, A is now uh, continuous in time for some fixed t naught and here of course uh, in the phase space the values are of course l x1 x naught uh, Lipschitz uh, so Lipschitz on bounded subsets Lipschitz uh, with respect uh, to u of t to the second argument as before bounded subsets. Uh, so this is nothing more what I need. Yeah? And uh, for the right hand side F, uh, it's, it's again, it maps uh, zero T naught times gamma to F. So I assume that as a function of t, it's measurable. It's measurable for every v in the, in the trace space. Then it's uh, continuous with respect to the second variable. F of t dot is continuous. Gamma t t uh, zero. Uh, this goes not to f t point wise zero for almost all t. Then I assume that uh, f of u naught is an LP of zero t naught with values in x naught, of course. And I assume that uh, I write it down uh, explicitly. It's local ellipses again. F of t u one minus f of t u2 less or equal than some Lipschitz constant with, but which depends on t and on r 
times uh, u1 minus u2 summation e. For all uh, u1 and u2 less than equal to r, so for every r there exists such a uh, Lipschitz constant, and this Lipschitz constant should be uh, integrable in this respect to t, which is Lp of zero. And then everything holds as before. So, for instance, we get uh, then the analog results hold. Hold. For instance, uh, for for large uh, for a small time existence, uh, for small time existence, we need uh, that a not now a of zero and u not, so the time is zero, so the value is u not has maximal value. Okay, just the, the main message is maybe uh, we are not restricted to autonomous equations. We can deal with non-autonomous equations as well. And uh, the essential point, for instance, for small time is so I freeze the time at time t equals zero and then I get the local existence huh, for some time period. Huh? So all these results can be generalized. And in this variant, this is already sufficient to deal with many problems of fluid mechanics, for instance. Yeah, and you can see uh, this statement, the proof, which is more or less the same proof as I did with some more technical estimates uh, and many applications, for instance, in this book uh, by uh, Plus and Timonet. So with these remarks, I would like to finish my series of talks and thank you for your attention.